when I was a kid. Oh, geez, did I really just say that? <sighs> so yes, back when I was a kid, cell phones were the size of bricks. The internet was only a sparkle in Al Gore's eye. And televisions had tubes. And they were proud of those tubes, thank you very much. <laughs> if you maybe decided one day to break out your dad's toolkit from the basement and work on that old black and white from Grandma's house, <laughs> hypothetically, of course, what you found was pretty simple. Some wires, some other random components, and a big old picture tube. One nice thing about those picture tubes, pretty much everything used the same standard. That made the job easy for all of those other components. But alas, those days are over. Now, if your kids try breaking into your TV, they're going to find a bunch of stuff they shouldn't mess with. And in all that mess, well, there lies the secret sauce that each company prides itself on. Today's display technology, from mobile devices to projectors to your own 56-inch home TV, depend on differentiated feature sets and support for a wide range of standards. And the speed in which you get those features in front of people will often determine your success. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. And my guest is Aaron Bayman of Xilinx, and we're going to get into the guts of displays. So break out your Phillips head screwdriver, some solder wick, and a pair of wire cutters. We're going in. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that you can click on that Download Now button below your player. There you can download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. Hi, Aaron. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Amelia. Nice to meet you. So Aaron, there is a lot of interest in the display market these days. What are you seeing? Well, let's start off by talking about some bad news. If you've been paying attention to what's been going on in the display market, everybody is losing money. Oh. Yeah, everybody is losing money. All the major brands are wrapping $10, $20, $50, even $100 around a lot of these sets. Uh, it's a very competitive, very price competitive market. Mm -hmm. And really to thwart that, what many of the brands are finding they need to do is they really need to differentiate or get out of the business. True. And to do that, they really need to focus on the feature sets and what kind of new and interesting features can be integrated into the display. So a lot of intense competition is driving a lot of great innovation right now. So I haven't busted into my TV for quite a while. What's in it? Well, let's take a look at a typical block diagram representing either a display or actually a projector. In, in reality, projection systems are display systems and their architectures are very similar to a uh, digital television. Okay. So regardless, you're going to need some way to bring video into the display. True. You can do that a number of ways. One way would be to bring in broadcast inputs. So that would be over the air, over terrestrial antennas. So having rabbit ears connected to your TV, a little mm -hmm. old school. But also cable TV uh, would be another example, or an analog tuner. In addition to that, we're finding more and more consumers are actually connecting external consoles or boxes. So it could be right. a game console, a Blu-ray player, or a DVD player. And that'll come in using HDMI or DVI as a primary connectivity standard. In addition to that, consumers may want to connect their TVs or projectors to their wireless networks. So mm -hmm. finding a lot of LAN ports on displays as well these days. Or USB ports or other types of IOs to connect other peripherals. Sure. So once you've got the video content in, you've got a front-end processor, which is demultiplexing the video decoding the video and audio, and then passing that on to really the, the heart of the architecture, which is the video processing function. In video processing, some of the key functions that you'll do in an SOC that's targeted to digital television will be the interlacing the video. Mm -hmm. In many cases, video comes in in interlaced fields and it needs to be stitched back together. Or you might be scaling the video up or down, okay. depending on the resolution that's coming in. And then you're also doing a lot of secret sauce in this area of the architecture, mm -hmm. a lot of sub-pixel processing to get that really fantastic picture quality that truly differentiates your company's products from another's. 
And then from there, it's a matter of then translating those signals into a format that can then be communicated to the bare panel that's in the display. I see. The point I want to make here is that throughout this type of an architecture, DDR, or memory, is critical in mm. these types of functions. You're having to dump video frames into memory as you're moving them through a video processing pipeline. So having a really robust memory system is, is critical when working with video. So this seems like a huge market. How is it segmented? Sure. Well, digital television is clearly the big 800-pound gorilla in this room. Sure. It's a $150 billion market Wow. with a lot of different interesting technology, but it's primarily dominated by LCD technology. We've seen PDP or plasma displays on the decline. Mm -hmm. We've also seen CRTs really almost go the way of the dodo. But in addition to this really huge market, we've also got other interesting market segments such as digital signage. Mm. So we're seeing video displays pop up at bus stops and airport terminals or train stations. In addition to that, there's a whole group of companies that are focused on the professional video display market. Mm -hmm. So this would be a company that's producing a display to be used in a post-production setting Okay. to make sure that what they're seeing after they've shot some video is, is color accurate and you know, meets the approval of the director. Sure. And then in addition to that, you have other interesting display technologies that are emerging for a whole host of different uses, like electrophoretic displays mm. that are used in e-books like the Kindle or OLED displays. And then certainly we have lots of different types of projectors, office projectors, digital cinema projectors, etc. So a lot of interesting uh, video applications, a lot of growth in this industry. It's a great place for FPGAs. Yeah, Aaron, this is really exciting. What do you think is driving this? Well, let's take a look at some of the trends to answer that question. If you, if you take a look at the world demand and the projections for displays, the forecasts for displays, you'll see that really North America and Western Europe will remain relatively stagnant. It's okay. a mature business. We're not seeing a lot of growth in that part of the world. Makes sense. What you are seeing, however, is tremendous, almost explosive growth in what we call the BRIC countries. So mm, places okay. like Brazil, Russia, India, China, just tremendous growth in those parts of the world. But in addition to that, I think it's also important to take a look at where the growth is occurring from a display size perspective. And essentially, anything that's below 40 inches is remaining fairly constant. It's not mm. really growing. It's a pretty mature size. Interesting. Where we're seeing huge growth, though, are in those displays that are greater than 40 inches. So the 50-inch, the 60-inch, mm -hmm. even some of these 80-inch displays, just unbelievable. All right, Aaron, I've heard this term, but I'm not sure what it means. What is 4K, 2K? Uh -huh. Okay, so this is actually a great emerging opportunity right now for FPGAs. 4K, 2K is essentially four times the resolution of full HD. Oh, okay. In fact, sometimes it's even referred to as quad FHD or quad full high definition. Okay. So if you would imagine stitching together in a two by two matrix full HD TVs, that mm -hmm. would be the equivalent resolution of 4K 2K. So actually, the focus of this new kit from Xilinx has really been in addressing some of these emerging opportunities. I think what would be really good would be to talk about the Xilinx advantage, some of the value advantage leadership that Xilinx has in the display space. And um, I think one of the most important points to make here is that this kit is really intended to help our customers accelerate their design productivity. So as we talk further about some of the reference designs and some of the features of this platform, mm -hmm. I think it'll be pretty apparent how we're going to help customers get to market a lot faster. In addition to that, this kit is based on the Kintec 7 family of FPGAs, Xilinx's okay. brand new mid-range FPGA brand. And we're seeing tremendous performance gains over the equivalent Vertex 6 or even Spartan 6 devices, which have been used in a lot of these types of architectures, especially in the area of I.O. speed supporting faster rates of, of I.O. to support some of these high-speed interfaces, uh, high-speed video interfaces, and then also the memory bandwidth. Mm, Again, okay. memory is critical in these types of architectures. Kintex is showing significant cost savings over older generation FPGA families like Vertex 6, so mm -hmm. that's helping customers further reduce bill of material costs. 
And in addition to that, as we go to the 28 nanometer HPL process, even lower power than we've seen in previous generations. And really, in addition to accelerating design productivity, we want to make sure that we're providing meaningful capabilities and reference designs that can be sucked into a single device, enabling more and more integration into a single device. So we have multiple versions of this kit targeting both the professional developer and the consumer electronics developer. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, Aaron, you said that Kintex is really good at this. Let's get down to some details. Absolutely, Amelia. So let's take a look at some of the key functions that can be implemented in a Kintex 7 device. Yeah. What you see here is very high level, but represents some of the key functions that are being implemented in the FPGA. For example, Xilinx FPGAs, and Kintex 7 in particular, can support a lot of the standard consumer electronics or professional input connectivity standards. And that okay. would include LVDS, mm -hmm. which may be if you're receiving in video signals from another board or another chip within an architecture. HDMI, if you're receiving in video from an external component. DVI, which is an old standard that's been well deployed. And then DisplayPort. So all of these functions can now be natively implemented in the FPGA. Ah, oh, okay. As I was alluding to earlier, really the secret sauce in these architectures and these designs comes mm -hmm. down to the video processing algorithms. Mm, okay. This is really where our customers can differentiate themselves from one another. Sure. And a lot of the base functions can be implemented in the FPGA. In fact, Xilinx has a low-cost IP bundle that includes over 17 Xilinx logic cores that perform a lot of these base video processing functions. That includes things like color space conversion. Mm. For example, if you're taking in DVI and you need to put it out over HDMI, you need to convert the color space. Mm -hmm. Gamma correction, deinterlacing video scaling, et cetera. A lot of these base functions are provided in a standard library from Xilinx. It costs only $3,000. And then getting it out of the FPGA is also critical. So being able to implement a different connectivity standard to get the video signals out are also critical. Okay, I'm still having trouble understanding some of the challenges for developing these 4K, 2K systems. Help me out with that, Aaron. Sure. So let me give you a bit more market context on what's going on. Yeah in particular in the consumption space of video. So as I'd mentioned, super high resolution 4K, 2K displays mm -hmm. are going to be very popular in the coming years. In fact, we're starting to see a lot of major brands begin to work on these initiatives, and we'll even start to see some of these displays in the big box stores in this Christmas season. Wow, okay. But some of the challenges um, that exist are, for example, let's say you're in a professional setting. You need to be able to watch native 4K content as it's been shot. That's creating a need to produce a lot more of these displays that will natively display 4K content. Mm -hmm. So in a post-production setting, but also at home. So you may not realize this, but a lot of the content that we enjoy on television is actually shot natively in 4K, 2K resolution, wow. but then okay. downscaled. So having a television that can natively display 4K resolution content will provide an even more immersive experience for the consumer. Now that's one side of the, the challenge. Another challenge that these manufacturers are facing is they need to be able to up-convert a lot of legacy content. Right. So if you can imagine as a new technology becomes popular, there's going to be a tremendous amount of legacy content at 1080p that needs to be upscaled. True. So initially, while consumer is a great eventual target for this type of technology, I think we'll at first see some of the, the key applications be the post-production studio monitors, mm. the digital cinema projection systems that are used to display 4K content natively at the Cineplex. Digital signage is another great opportunity. Mm -hmm. We're seeing more and more video signage pop up all over the place. And then also, of course, there are the early adopters that have the money to spend on these high-end home theater setups. Sure. And then, of course, academic and government settings will be other interesting areas where we'll see these displays first take off. All right. That's pretty exciting. What kinds of kits do you have to support display development? Sure. So let's take a look at the Kintec 7 display kit, which is what we want to talk about here today. Perfect. Basically, this kit is, is really, it's a lot more than just a kit. It's, it's a true platform in the sense that it's comprised of a hardware platform, which mm -hmm. is this Kintec 7 baseboard along with FMCs that support these various consumer interfaces. 
It's also based on Xilinx LogiCore IP blocks that are sure. put together in tested reference designs, which allow our customers to get up and running much faster. And so again, it's those three components together that comprise this kit. Okay. Hardware platform, Xilinx logic cores, and three reference designs. I'll talk a bit more about the reference designs in a few minutes, but it includes a reference design for mosaic, so being able to put oh, multiple okay. video images on a single display, mm -hmm. a scaler or an up converter, and then also an FRC or a frame rate converter. And I'll talk a bit more about why that's an important reference design. Okay, cool. Tell us about how these kits are configured. Certainly. So these kits will be sold in three configurations. Okay. There'll be a foundation kit, which will provide the basic building blocks to get up and running. So that would include the baseboard, which has the four independently addressable DDR3 memories and FMC connectors. It will also then include FMCs to support HDMI 1.4a, TX, and RX. Okay. And then it'll also provide access to the user for these reference designs. And then all of the other standard stuff that comes in a kit, like a JTAG programming cable and a power supply. Sure. There's a professional TV kit and a professional broadcast kit. Oh, okay. Really, the difference here is it comes with everything that I'd mentioned in the foundation kit. The only difference here for the Pro TV kit is it will also include an FMC card supporting LVDS and V by 1. And then the professional kit will not include the consumer interface FMCs, but will include an FMC supporting SDI. Mm. SDI or 3G SDI, triple rate SDI, is a standard that's used by the broadcast industry. So similar to the consumer interfaces, but specific to that industry. I see. All right. I see you have a picture of a board here. <laughs> Tell us what's on it. Sure. So... Most important, this board is centered around the Kintec 7 325T. Uh -huh. This is actually the largest package available, so we're bringing out all of the I.O. to a total of four FPGA mezzanine cards or FMC ports. The two that you see on the top are low pin count FMC connectors. Okay. And then the two in the lower left-hand corner are the high pin count, so supporting the, the higher speed Surtees-based interfaces. Mm-hmm. And then the other key point to highlight here is, again, this is truly a targeted video platform in the sense that we're bringing out lots of DDR3. Mm -hmm. We're bringing four independently addressable DDR3 memory modules, okay. which allows a customer to segment their video processing pipeline and then have dedicated memory for each of the you know, many key functions within that processing pipeline. This looks great. Aaron, tell us a little bit more about the reference designs. Absolutely. So why don't we start with the mosaic reference design? The intent here is to give the user right out of the box the ability to take in four independent 1080i inputs and be able to display all of them simultaneously on a 4K 2K display. Very cool. Yeah, so a, a great advantage here from using this reference design is that the customers can now actually verify and validate their algorithms down to the pixel level. Oh. So they can verify almost in a real-time flow that the picture quality meets their, their standards mm, before okay. they finalize their algorithms. Very important because, again, it's very difficult to simulate video. Sure. You need to simulate video in silicon. You can't do it on a PC. Right. It's just not feasible. So why don't we take a look at the next reference design. The next reference design is Xilinx's scalar reference design. Okay. So this will allow for a single 1080i input which can be scaled all the way up to 4K 2K or scaled all the way down to 1080, 1080p. Ah, oh, okay. So again, an advantage here is, is that they can use this reference design as a basis for a more complex reference design. 4K 2K up converters are going to be a very interesting topic for a lot of folks working in this space. And they really want to be able to get up and running as quickly as they possibly can. Sure. So that they can focus on, again, that, that secret sauce, fine-tuning that picture quality algorithm. And then lastly, let's take a look at the frame rate converter reference design. Okay. So one point I want to make is all of the panels for 4K 2K displays that are coming out are at 120 hertz. But a lot of the content that's coming into these architectures is at 60 hertz. Ah, all right. So you need to implement an FRC, a frame rate converter, or a frame doubler in this case, so that you can actually display video on the display, oh, on okay. the bare panel. In addition to this, being able to provide this base 
simplified frame rate converter that's essentially doubling frames. Mm -hmm. It'll allow customers to work on some of the more complex frame rate converters. Uh. For example, taking in 24 frames per second and then converting that to 60 and then to 120. When you do that, you're dealing in a more sophisticated space like motion estimation, motion Mm -hmm. compensation. So by being able to provide this base functionality allows our customers to get to work a lot faster. Okay, Aaron, we've covered a bunch of stuff today. Let's circle back and cover a couple of your main points. Okay. So I think it's pretty clear in order to be competitive in the biggest market here in the digital television space, our customers or folks working in that space are really going to need to differentiate in order to be competitive. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that a lot of them are choosing to do that is by focusing on this 4K, 2K opportunity. It truly is an emerging trend and Xilinx and its Kintec 7 display kit is intended to be a comprehensive platform that will allow customers to get to these developments and get to them much faster, get products out a lot faster than ever before. Okay, Aaron, I'm probably not going to go bust into my TV at home, so where do I go for more information? (laughs) Okay, so to learn more about what's included in the kit, you certainly can go to xilinx.com forward slash display. There you'll be able to request access for the reference designs. Okay. Certainly you can click on the links on those pages, which will allow you to buy the kit. And if you want up-to-the-minute information, I always encourage folks to follow us on Facebook and Twitter or check out the YouTube channel that we have for Xilinx. Great. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me today, Aaron. My pleasure. Nice chatting with you. And before we go, don't forget to click that Download Now button below the player to download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. For Chalk Talk, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out the On Demand section of eejournal.com. <laughs>